<laughs> okay, shouldn't have said that. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I would like to talk about uh, this topic, visual functions and neural processes that mark the transition from conscious to unconscious, unconscious to conscious processing. Uh, in doing so, I would like to address these topics. So, is it indeed possible to uh, identify particular functions that mark this transition? Uh, and can we identify neural processes that go along with this transition? And of course, you know, when we uh, talk about such a transition, we should also ask, well, what exactly is unconscious vision? Of course, there's a lot of debate about that recently. You know, objective visibility, subjective visibility, things like that. Uh, and of course, we should also talk, talk about the report issue and uh, have some afterthoughts. All right, visual functions. Um, I'm not a philosopher, not even a psychologist. My background is medicine, by the way. But, but the, the only thing I ever did was just record neurons, basically and maybe also some EEG signals and things like that. But if you record neurons, of course, if you look at visual functions that these neurons uh, enable or perform, uh, well, one of the most basic ones, of course, would be that neurons do what's called feature detection. You know, they, they detect orientations and directions of motions and colors and things like that, depth. Uh, typically executed by all these different visual areas. So that's one visual function. Now, it should be noted that while executing these, these feature detections, um, these neurons often also combine, already combine these, these features in that they're simultaneously tuned to, say, f a direction of motion and orientation, as shown in this example. Yeah, so neuron only uh, responding to this orientation when it moves in a particular direction, not in the other one. This is what Peter Rosson has called base groupings. In a sense, of course, it is a grouping operation in the sense that two different features are now grouped into the activity of a single neuron, but it's, yeah. So in that sense, it's a grouping. Now, of course, besides these, say, fairly low-level feature detections, of course, there's also lots of high-level feature detection going on in the uh, visual brain. Most prominent example probably is face-selective cells. Of course, a face is a fairly complex constellation of features. You can imagine that it needs a lot of intricate processing to, to detect such a constellation of features. But nevertheless, we have single neurons that you know, can do that. Uh, but of course, there's, uh, the, uh, there's also these famous recordings in humans where, you know, s with the Jennifer Aniston cell, the, the Bill Clinton cell, you know, very, very, <laughs> even more specific combinations of features that are detected by these kinds of cells, so identi identities, objects. Of course, we have these very dedicated areas, for example, for the processing of words. There are people in the room who know much more about that than me, of course, but, but you, might, you might even argue that we have dedicated systems for detecting emotions and maybe gist, all sorts of, all sorts of fairly high-level features that we have very dedicated, specific systems for. And maybe up to the point of having very dedicated and specific neurons. Now, of course, at some point, all these different features start to, well, what I call here, interfere. 